Good morning and good afternoon uh, to everybody. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Extract and Panton. Before we begin, um, I want to go through a few housekeeping points uh, so that we are all in line of what we're doing. Because of the number of people that we have today in the line, everybody will be keep kept muted. Um, but if during the webinar you have any questions, please do not hesitate to raise those questions and use the, the area in the panel of GoToWebinar to post uh, your questions. I will be moderating this webinar and at the end of, the, of this webinar we will have a short Q&A session where uh, we will try to answer all of your questions. Um, just a reminder to everybody, uh, this webinar will be recorded and uh, you will receive after in two days after the webinar you will receive or on Friday you will receive the link so that you can review the webinar at your own convenience. Um, we will have also during the webinar a couple of polls so that it gives us uh, uh, some ideas of where you are. Uh, so again, uh, welcome to the webinar. Today we will be discussing color management for grant format painters. This is the first of uh, a series of three webinars, so we have two more to go after this one. My name is Paula Rosales. I am the marketing manager for the print and packaging area of x uh, in Europe. And as I mentioned, I would be the moderator for this. Just a little bit of a background about x uh, Many of you uh, have heard of x Xrite and Pantone is the global leader in color science and technology. And, uh, in, you know, Egg Pantone is part of the family uh, of X-Ray. As uh, uh, many of you know, we have the Pandex, but we also have uh, communication tools uh, for uh, the iPhone we, and the iPad. Uh, we just launched something uh, which is Color 2, which is for photography. We're in the print uh, and pre-press and packaging. And there are also a couple of different industries where we are, which is the textile, automotive, Basically, we are everywhere where color is important. Um, as we have been evolving, and definitely we have been focusing on some of the products uh, that you will be uh, seeing today and that uh, uh, Dan, who is to get today with me, will be also presenting and the advantages of these solutions that we have um, been developing for uh, these markets. Again, um, with us today, we have Dan Reed, um, Dan has been for more than 15 years a, a provider of color management consulting services a, to many of the leading brands and printing services providers. He's also a G7 certified expert since 2006, so an early adopter. He has helped numerous uh, businesses achieve the merits of the G7 printing calibration method. Dan's company, RP Imaging, helps business maximize their profit potential by decreasing waste and improving efficiency and reputability uh, for the commercial trade and grant format printing customers. Dan keeps on the forefront of digital imaging by serving as beta tester um, for many leading software developments, including x -ray. In the printing, he writes also for trade publications and uh, he defines custom color management workflows for businesses. Dan, welcome to today's webinar. And we are all very excited to have you with us. And uh, yeah, we hope that we have a great and entertaining webinar and uh, very interesting for all of us. Thank you, Paula. Good morning, everyone. Well, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be addressing uh, printer calibrations and just kind of want to break down the things that we're going to be discussing here. Um, we're going to be looking specifically uh, not about color management, but just the process before that. So some of you know that it is very critical to have good process control and good calibration prior to doing color management. And so we're starting off the series with discussing how do you evaluate uh, how uh, to do calibrations for your printers and how to see if it's successful or not. Um, we will kind of touch upon ink limiting, different methods of calibrating, uh, what is this G7 process, 
and uh, end up uh, with uh, some tips and tricks that are specific for the grant format um, um, printing uh, industry. And finally, um, uh, open the floor for questions and answers. But first off, uh, Paula, could you launch our first poll question, please? Paula? Uh, so if you are ready, all would be so kind um, to, to see and uh, start putting the, uh, some of the answers of the poll. We've already started to see some answers. Uh, uh, as we wait for everybody to, to give us their answers, we afterwards will uh, close the poll and okay. show you some of the results. We are at this point at 58, 60%. It's growing. Uh, so we'll see um, in a second when we reach the 100%. Can you share the results uh, when it's closed? Absolutely, I will do that. We're at eighty percent. A couple of more. I guess that's it, and we will close the poll. We got eight percent, and I will share the results. Can you see the results uh, of the it? No, I can't. One second. Can you see the results now? Uh, I cannot. Um, maybe we could just read off the results. Yes, sure. So the majority of business that, that we have uh, um, here are actually being uh, a screen printing. We have 8%. We have 3% uh, of flexography. Uh, we have uh, a grand format printing, 20%. Large format printing, we have 52%. And commercial sheet offset, we have 18%. OK. And how much was screen again, the first? 8%. 8%. Okay. Wow, we have a pretty good uh, uh, wide group of people uh, that are on the call. Um, as a, s a second uh, follow-up question, uh, you can launch that poll now. Yeah, Dan, give me one second because I think that uh, we've lost your your uh, screen for something. I cannot see your screen currently. Can you see my screen now? Can everybody um, lift their hands if they can see Dan's screen? There is a... Nope. So give me one second. Um, Dan, can you say share your screen? So that... Um... Mm, it looks like it is sharing it, as far as I know. The poll window is still up, though. Okay, let me... How do you close the quick poll? Yeah. Now, can you share it again? Uh, I think it is showing my screen. Let's see if other... No. Okay. No? Okay. Give me one second and I'll try to uh, to do something. Okay. Sorry, folks. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So I will um, show the second poll. Um, if everybody can rate this one, how confident are you in matching previously uh, printed jobs? 
So far we are at 40, 54, 56%. Okay. So I'll be closing the poll now. If nobody else uh, puts in their numbers, we have had uh, a that 24% uh, say that uh, uh, they have no problem, 54% say that probably, and 22% they're not sure, they do not know. Okay. So you can still see my screen at this point? Yep. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, now that we've got a couple polls out of the way, I have a good un understanding of who's on the call and kind of some of the challenges that we have here. Um, if, uh, time and time again, when I talk to uh, different print service providers, they're always eager to improve, but it's funny how they miss out on the first step, which is in order to improve their color, they first must be able to measure it. You cannot eyeball this stuff. Not possible. Um, there's many reasons why we can't eyeball it, and the first being that um, you're influenced by a lot of external stimuli which will affect your perception of color. So you are a variable, and so you will not be able to have consistency in printing your business. So this is why you absolutely 100% need to have a measurement device. And there's many different options available today, but the first step is you got to have a measurement device. And it's really not that expensive. In the grand scheme of things, it's only a couple thousand dollars. And when you look at the investment that you've made in, in your printer technology, it's very, very minor. And it's arguably uh, one of the more important investments because you're selling color, you're not selling printing technology to your clients. So when we start measuring, we are able to extrapolate information to define how close we're able to match colors and one way that we're able to do this is using a, a metric called the Delta E and there's been several different updates over the years uh, of Delta E but when someone throws out a Delta E number usually they're referring to Delta E 76 this is kind of the more basic uh, Delta E for formula but we're now coming to a point where we're finally trying to transition the industry to a, a better model uh, that matches our eyes a little better called Delta E2000 or Delta E00. And this is being uh, specced out in a lot of the ISO uh, documents right now as uh, the recommended Delta E formula. So this image is, comes from uh, a product called Spot On Press. Um, it's a company up in uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, I like this. It's a very nice way of showing the difference of the two models. So same measurements, just how you're actually evaluating it. So in a Delta 76 model, on the left-hand side, you see that it's not within tolerance, not within that inner circle. But if you change it to a Delta E 2000 model, um, you see now the color is within tolerance. So it's really important that if you're going to be talking about Delta E and expressing that um, uh, to your clients or uh, having a shop standard that you define what that Delta E uh, is supposed to be. So there's different methods that you can use for ink limiting. Um, one of the more common methods is what they call spectral density. And this is a method where you use a spectral photometer to gather uh, spectral information and then you, you derive density from it just using uh, mathematics. And uh, that is a very popular method in grand format uh, RIPs. Another method that is out there is chromatic where instead of looking at how much uh, ink is piled on the paper which will be density, it's now looking at how saturated that color is and define okay I'm going to limit based upon the maximum chroma because that after a certain point you may find that putting more ink on the paper is not necessarily giving you more color it's just giving you a darker uh, color at the same chroma value 
And then lastly here we have AB, which is of LAB, and this considers now the hue angle. And so that's useful because now you can actually take a look at, hey, if I actually put more ink on the paper, is this becoming a different color? Not only is it getting darker, but it's potentially shifting hue. And that can be problematic because if it shifts hue, you may find out that your three-quarter tones have a different hue than you do in your quarter tones. And this becomes even more dramatic if you have uh, lights, so like a light cyan or a light magenta, um, that you may find that as you get into the quarter tones where there's less of the dark uh, ink that you have more of a hue shift. So restricting uh, aggressively based upon chroma and hue will kind of keep things a little bit more in line. So as we look at this chart, you can see that the cyan, as we add more ink, is making a hue shift towards magenta. It's going towards the right. And as you see on the magenta, the more ink you put down, it's actually shifting more towards the yellow. So ideally, these would be straight lines jettisoning out from the center. But that's just not how things work. So we need to kind of pull back ink because um, we don't want to have two different colors based upon our quarter tones and our three-quarter tones. And what I'm taking, talking about here is kind of your mid-tones to your shadows, essentially. Looking again at this picture, you can see that putting down more ink if you uh, are achieving more saturation, it would go further out towards the perimeter of this graph. So in the case of looking at the magenta, we see that the last dot is still a little bit more close to the right than the second dot. So we are achieving more chroma there. So it is getting more saturated, but it's actually changing hue. So that may not be what we want. Same thing is going on for the cyan. You see it is still kind of going outwards, meaning it is getting more colorful, but it's shifting hue quite a bit. So here is another picture. Um, it's a little bit hard to see kind of the yellow and the black and the cyan, but let's just focus on the magenta right now. So you can see that the, the quarter tones in an uncalibrated state are pretty far spaced apart. And as we get into the three quarter tones, uh, they start kind of getting much, much closer together. So you could see this visually just by printing out uh, a, a chart that has, you know, 10% increments of each color and just look at it visually or and or you can measure it and bring it into a, a graphing program. So X-Rite has a graphing program built into their i1 profiler. I'm using a program here to illustrate and it's called Chromix Color Think. Um, it's a very inexpensive program, but it's a wonderful educational tool to see what's going on as you do ink limiting and calibrations. So once we restrict it, now you can see uh, that things are a little bit closer uh, on a straight line. Not exact, but we were able to kind of restrict quite a bit of color uh, 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 being put down, which is going to result in ink savings, but it's also going to help <clears throat> in uh, having a more well-behaved uh, profile. So right now with the ink restrictions you can see that hey it's a little bit straighter but still the balls are not nicely evenly spaced. And here's a picture again of how much ink I was uh, pulled off on the magenta and you can see there in the background as well for the cyan I pulled off quite a bit of ink there. So if I just count up those little dots because I usually do things in 10 percent it looks like I almost cut the magenta uh, on 10, 20, 30, almost like 40 or 50 percent there. That's a huge reduction. Um, and that's going to obviously save money, but it's going to save uh, drying time. So you're not going to have problems with drying. And it's going to make this whole calibration and profiling process a lot easier. So let's talk about calibration. Usually it's the same method that you use for ink limiting. Rarely do they kind of switch between spectral density for ink limiting and then use chromatic for your linearization. It's usually kind of the same method. Um, advanced methods allow you to kind of uh, refine by neutrality, and that's kind of what the G7 process is about, is saying, hey, let's now linearize our device or get it into an optimum state, 
and then secondarily let's adjust that slightly so the device has a natural gray balance to start with and there's going to be a lot of people out there that kind of discount G7 for uh, uh, printing processes outside of uh, commercial sheet fed offset lithography but I can tell you from you know lots and lots of experience it is definitely useful for other print processes so people in Flexo, Screen, uh, obviously Grand Format can definitely find benefit of implementing the G7. So again here is an uncalibrated printer with ink limiting and here is now a calibrated printer. Notice how now all those patches are nice and evenly spaced. If we focus on the magenta there for a second you can see there is a bigger space between kind of let's say that that mid-tone and three-quarter tones so that means that that calibration was not quite as good there on the magenta but it certainly is a lot better than what it was so here now I'm overlaying um, the before and after the red dots being uh, what they were beforehand so you see how they're shifting inward and being more evenly spaced apart so this is what you want to be seeing and I again like to use a, a graphing program to kind of confirm that the calibrations that I'm doing are uh, being done correctly or I'm doing a good job because uh, my eye will tell me and say I'm doing a good job but I would like to utilize the measurement devices that we have available to confirm that the steps that I'm doing are actually correct and I'm headed in the right direction so a lot of rip vendors will um, uh, supply uh, data sets but they, obviously they can't do it for every media they can't do it for every uh, resolution out there it's just not possible for them and it's really not their business model so um, you will find some that are available but invariably that's why you have a measurement device you want to create your own you're going to get the best results it's going to kind of wrap up all the the things that are going on with your printing device the where that has happened to date you know the type of media all those sort of things so you know you can use the supply data sets as a starting point but uh, you'd be best served by using a, a color measurement device here we're seeing on the left hand side uh, uh, a swap to separation um, on the middle uh, you're seeing a vendor supplied ICC profile not a bad color match not great but it's okay um, but the custom profile that was generated on the right hand side um, definitely has a much better color match. Is it a perfect color match to swap to? No. But it's a much better color match. And so you have to think about this is that like when we're you know doing these uh, uh, conversions from a reference like swap or grackle, most of the time we won't be able to get a perfect color match just because that print process that we're using is not swap or grackle and so we're doing the best that we can but it's never going to be perfect and so unless they have a, a reference that they're going to be um, having next to your printed production piece uh, they won't be able to see the difference unless they always have that reference there So in a vendor supply profile, you can see here that looking at the bottom left-hand corner going from zero, there's a little bump there in the cyan, and the cyan seems to be dominant until you get around to about 30%. When you look at 30%, you see that cyan dips down, and then magenta comes up around, oh, I don't know, 40% starts becoming dominant. And what that means is that you have a color crossover. So you're seeing now like, hey, in that particular area, if you had neutralities, that it may shift towards the red end of things. And that's not such a great thing. We want to uh, eliminate um, uh, crossovers. If you apply a G7 type of calibration, you can see now that that helps quite a bit because your cyan is always dominant and then the magenta and yellow subordinate. So now you won't have a color crossover. And so this is one of the things of why I say G7 is very helpful for different print processes, even though it wasn't developed initially for uh, offset and sheet fed, um, excuse me, for a screen and flex zone, things of that sort. Um, it is very helpful to kind of make sure that you don't have color crossovers there. 
And we're going to go into more about the G7 process in the second webinar. So here's some tips that I have for folks that are printing on grand format devices. Um, we would think that these devices have nice consistency, but I've been proven time and time again there is quite a bit of variability that's going on there. And so I recommend kind of taking a chart. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a profiling chart, but it can be any uh, like color bar or something like that and putting a gray background. And this will allow you to quickly see visually without even measuring stuff like, geez, that corner over there has a slight color cast compared to this one over here. Let me go grab my measurement device and measure those two areas and see if I have uh, a change there. So if you do have a change, then you know that, hey, I better either A, call up and get my device um, uh, ma uh, maintenanced, or B, know that um, I shouldn't be printing over there, or C, know that, you know, I need to do a lot of averaging, just like a regular printing press, um, to kind of get a good sense of what the, the variability is across that sheet. So um, methods to do this would be to take uh, like a color bar like this uh, 12647 one from ID Alliance, or the newer one that came out uh, last year, uh, which is a three-tier uh, 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 bar. But it really doesn't matter what the bar is, is that you just want to con, you know, um, uh, have consistency in checking uh, with the same data set. So you don't want to have different data sets. So rotate this chart you know, 180 degrees, rotate it 90 degrees, put it in different locations and start measuring uh, just certain patches and, and, and see if you're having the same results. And you might be surprised um, at how much uh, variance that you're seeing across your printed area there. Um, the IT873 and 74 charts were never designed for grand format printing. Um, my opinion is they don't have enough patches to really characterize uh, what's going on there. And they certainly aren't designed uh, for grand format because they're designed for really high resolution printing, um, which is not what we're dealing with in grand format. Uh, usually we're going the opposite uh, direction. So I don't think that we should be using that. Uh, specifically because the charts will be difficult to measure if we're printing at a very low resolution. You'll find that you have lots of trouble where it's just erroring out just because it's not uh, printed at 150 line screen or 175 line screen. Some of our printing devices out there because they are being viewed at such a far different uh, distance um, can easily be down at 100 line screen or lower. So uh, we have to consider that and therefore, I don't feel like these charts are the best thing for you. So the better way would be to create your own chart, uh, and that would be in your i1 profiler product or whatever chart generator that you're using. So if you have an i1 Pro, I recommend that you start off with maybe a 10 to 12 millimeter patch, uh, and this will help in kind of giving you a bigger area to sample. Um, you know, it's going to make your charts, uh, you know, several pages, and it's going to require more measurement. And you may scoff at that initially, but if you try to compress things down and get the smallest patches, you may just be frustrated by it just not being able to recognize one patch to the next. Because you remember, the way the i1 Pro 1 works, or the original i1, is it's got to see um, a difference between one patch to the next. So on the bottom here, you see that they put alternating black and white depending upon uh, you know, the, uh, the color of the patch. With the I1 I.O. table, um, you also want to be using uh, large patches too. This is even more important uh, as that device uh, slides over uh, the chart. If it does not recognize uh, in, in its uh, normal mode, it will drop down to a low resolution mode. And if it doesn't get into the low resolution mode, then it will go down to spot mode. And that is a very, very slow process. So again, having bigger patches is going to make that device a little bit easier to measure uh, charts. And I, I know it's going to be frustrating to say, geez, I've now got five uh, uh, charts to measure instead of maybe three. But you may find that that is going to be a little more consistent uh, with getting into measure uh, instead of being frustrated by having to remeasure uh, columns uh, that uh, weren't measuring correctly. 
The newer i1 Pro 2, though, uh, actually works pretty well with low resolution because it uses this new Zebra pattern that they have there. It's uh, an alternating black and white uh, uh, strips there, and it can tell the location. On the bottom of the i1 Pro 2 is a little uh, a light sensor that is uh, uh, keeping track of that. So unlike the i1 Pro uh, original device that had to check to have different colors to see where it was at, that's no longer the case with the i1 Pro 2. So um, again, if you're using uh, grand format, I think a 10 millimeter uh, would be uh, good. Uh, you could go lower, of course. Uh, but I tend to try to go for bigger patches, I think you're seeing with me. Uh, it's, it's a way that uh, you can have better consistency in your measurements. Remember, if, you, if you've got a really low resolution uh, printer, you're going to be measuring more of the substrate uh, that's going to be coming through because the dots are not placed uh, 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 close enough in high resolution. So that's why we want a bigger patch is to uh, be able to measure a, a larger area of that color. The other thing I put down here is that this new um, uh, ruler is made out of metal so it won't uh, stick where we had problems with the original uh, ruler from the i1 Pro 1 uh, where it you know, on solvent printers it had sometimes a tendency to kind of adhere itself. So they addressed that in the i1 Pro 2. And with the, the second generation of the I.O., we can use patches that are 10 by 8. Um, again, uh, if you're going to be building this in the I1 Profiler, I suggest that you use the non-compatibility mode uh, for the best layout. If you use the compatibility mode, um, it's not going to give you the, the, the best layout and it's going to re result in more charts to measure. So, um, in order to sum things up here, uh, if you want to have repeatable color, you're going to have to measure it. You know, it's absolute requirement. Uh, if you do not have a measurement device, this would be the time to start looking at an investment. It's really inexpensive at this point. Um, I would be measuring color bars on all my printing devices, and that way I can start tracking whatever drift is happening, however major or minor that is, but that will help dictate as to how frequently you need to calibrate. Um, there's uh, lots of different RIP softwares that have verifiers that uh, can be added that will assist in kind of uh, determining how frequently you need to calibrate. The i1 Pro 2 family consists of the Basic Pro and i1 Publish and the IO uh, second generation. The difference between the basic and the publish is really just software. Same hardware, you know, there's maybe some differences in attachments or, or accessories, but really it's just software. So if you uh, have the capability of building your own profiles within uh, your RIP, you could probably start off with an i1 basic, but you might be well served uh, investing in the i1 publish pro too because uh, it has an improved profiler that uh, may give you some uh, additional features that are not available within your RIP uh, product. So at this point, Paula, why don't we la uh, launch our last poll question? Sure, and as, I, as he said, it is the last poll that we have. Uh, do you have challenges matching across different thinking technologies? So you can give us an answer on that. Uh, that's the last one, and then uh, I'm uh, sure that we're almost uh, at the end to open for the Q&A. And uh, so if you have also some questions that you would like to ask, so far we have uh, just a bunch, a handful, so that would be great. Um, in regards to the results, we have 13% uh, uh, no, they don't think to have any challenges on matching color. 71% say sometimes, and 16% we need help. So You said yeah. 60 or 16? 16%. 16. 16. So what's the majority there? It's sometimes it will be sometimes. 71%. Yeah. That's kind of what I expect, you know, like sometimes we're able to do it and sometimes we're not. Um, and that's good because that 
that uh, kind of brings us into our next webinar, which is going to be discussing about uh, G7 and how that might help us in kind of harmonizing uh, color across different printing uh, technologies. So we're going to kind of delve into that, discuss what it is, what it's not, why would you would do it, or maybe why you shouldn't do it. That's going to happen on April 22nd. And then the final webinar that we're going to be doing is uh, um, uh, talking about how to accept files, different file formats, uh, references, PMS colors, all the things that people are supplying you and, and trying and, and, sh and showing you how to translate that to make sure that you have a consistent reproduction across your different printing technologies. And that's going yeah, to be and all of you, Exactly. And all of you will receive, uh, a, again, with the, with the link of the recording of this webinar, uh, you will receive also the link if you're interested in participating to any of the other two webinars. Okay, so at this point uh, I want to open it up uh, for questions. You can type it into uh, the question bar that's on the right hand side and uh, exactly. Paula so will start firing them off to me. You can yeah. uh, further post questions uh, through the Twitter hashtag xwritewebinar14 or if you want you can email me directly at uh, dread at rpimaging.com. Exactly. So, so we, Paul, with the first, we have some uh, questions quest here. Yes. Uh, um, and the first question is uh, how you, do you define the difference of grand format uh, versus large format printing? Well, um, large format is more of a high resolution printing. So this would be your HP 62, 6100s. This would be your Epson uh, 10600, 9900s. These are devices that I would say are under 60 inches. The grand format printers would be more considered like latex, UV, solvent, uh, things that are uh, you know uh, over 60 inches. And these are more uh, typically lower resolution devices because they will be viewed from afar, whereas the large format printing devices are usually um, viewed a little bit closer and therefore they're a higher resolution. Great, thank you. Um, in a couple of slides uh, before, in the beginning, actually, you were talking about uh, in Delta E, and at a point you mentioned about the change of. Uh, is the delta E formula and why the question is why would uh, the delta E formula change? Sure. Um, so not to get into the deep deep history but consider that delta E 76 looks like a basketball and so very evenly spaced obviously uh, you know round and all that sort of stuff but it really we don't have a very linear uh, sensitivity to color. We have higher sensitivities to greens than we do to like let's say blues. And so as uh, we've evolved uh, with the science behind this they now have made it so let's call it, it looks like a football. So it's kind of teardrop so it's no longer kind of a big uh, circle like a basketball and now it looks like a teardrop and so you could have colors that um, are on the fringes that just a subtle move uh, could be pretty dramatic to the eye. And whereas other colors, you can have a lot of play in there and you still would be good. So my kind of uh, rule of thumb is to use Delta E76 to check to see if things are mechanically the same. So, hey, is my printer printing the same way daily, you know? But do I have a good color match? Well, I would tend to use a Delta E2000 to say, regardless if the printer is uh, calibrated or not, do we have a color match here? Because that's what's most important to my, my customer. So it really depends on what you're trying to evaluate. Um, you know, are you trying to evaluate the color match or are you trying to evaluate if the device has gone out of uh, calibration? Great, thank you. Um, can you share the specific G7 benefits for the large and grand format printing? In the second webinar, I'd be happy to do so. <laughs> but yes, uh, there's a lot of benefits that go on for the, the G7 process for uh, grand format. The main thing is that you'll find that um, different grand format printing technologies have different biases. And when we create a profile, as you saw in one of the pictures there, it can take care of that in kind of uh, dealing with imbalancing grays. 
but it can only do so much. You know, remember, the profile is not designed to fix things. It's not designed to fix things. It's only designed to describe what's going on. So if the gray balance is off, it's got to fix it. And that's not what I think it should be doing, which is why I kind of want to do that sort of fixing in the calibration process. So by the time I'm making my profile, everything printing out should be gorgeous. It should you know, have good saturation, no uh, ink pulling. It shouldn't have a, a, a color tint or a color bias. So it should just be great, and that's when I make my profile. Great, thank you. Um, what is your advice on embedding the CMYK profile into a PDF for repurposing to another CMYK device? Mm -hmm. Embedding a profile into a PDF is um, a little bit uh, challenging just because a lot of the RIPs do not properly recognize the embedded profiles within a PDF. And so uh, the PDF architecture has something called an output intent, but uh, very few RIPs actually honor and recognize that. Um, most of the RIPs will recognize embedded profiles of the, uh, within the images, but they probably won't recognize in, uh, anything that's uh, assigned to a vector object. So usually the recommendation is not to uh, uh, honor the embedded profiles uh, in the document, is to make default settings in your RIP. That way you have consistency. If you see that uh, or know that this customer uh, is using other profiles than your default, and then that would be a good reason to convert those objects prior to sending to your RIP so you harmonize it all to that default color space. So, but using embedded profiles within PDF uh, could give you a lot of variability depending upon who's uh, sending you that PDF and how they set it up. Perfect. Um, how prevalent are OBA, so optical brightener agents, in some of the grant format substrates? Oh, very prevalent. What they're taught, what this person's asking about is the um, it's uh, very common to put optical brightening agents, which we call OBAs, and what I like to kind of call Clorox bleach for the papers. Make my whites look whiter. And you can find this out really easily uh, just by going and getting a black light and going into a dark room with your substrate and see if it glows and look at your socks and see them glow and look at your teeth see how it glows and this is just optical brighteners you know you got the whitening toothpaste you got the stuff in your detergent to make your whites look whiter well, it's the same thing in your papers if you want to get scientific you measure the the white point of the paper and if you see on the B axis a negative you know three negative four or higher then you're seeing that they put optical brighteners in there one of the nice things with the X-Ray products is that their I1 profiler does take this into account. So as you're building your profile, there's a way that you can uh, tell it that, hey, I want to uh, account for optical brighteners agents in my paper. And it will um, uh, basically take two measurements and ascertain uh, what type of corrective action is necessary. In the olden days, we just basically put on uh, sunglasses, which they called UV cut filters. Just like your sunglasses block those UV, harmful UV lights from entering my eyes, well, the same thing that we would do on the measurement device. But in this day and age, we don't do that. We just use math. So we measure it, and then mathematically, we kind of uh, get it out. So this would be uh, potentially a reason why you would want to get the i1 Publish Pro 2, because you would have that software available to take that into account. Your profiling software and your RIP may not deal with OBAs. So that's something to um, investigate with your particular RIP platform. Um, what are your thoughts on using two different RIPs for printing? We're currently using Colorburst for our Epson GS6000 and an EFIRE for our Wootech printer. Um, it's, it's challenging, right? You've basically got two different methods uh, for calibrating, two different approaches. You know, the EFI approach is uh, uh, different from uh, the, the color burst approach. Um, and so to achieve 
consistency, uh, print, uh, color consistency between those devices is going to be challenging. It's not impossible, but you're going to be more challenged just because you have got to try to do the same thing on a different RIP platform. So um, there are options available where you could put uh, what they call a color server in front of it, which means that you would be doing kind of the color management before it would go to the color burst or the EFI, and therefore you have potentially a little more consistency in your color conversions. And most of the color servers available allow you to actually apply correction curves so again, you can use a similar, uh, more similar method of calibrating uh, by using the color server instead of uh, using the unique tools of each RIP platform. Will Publish handle OBAs during the optimization process also? Um, the OBAs are really uh, dealt with during the, the profiling, not the optimization. So in optimization routine, uh, what's happening there, what they're talking about is that you, let's say you decide to make a profile based upon 2,000 patches. I'm just throwing out a number here. At the end, you have the option to say, hey, let me optimize this profile and come up with an additional 400 or 2,000 patches of the, that are different than the original 2,000 patches. Because if you think about it, you don't want to be measuring 10,000 patches. It's just not possible. So, um, you know, how, how, what's the least amount of patches I need to get a good profile? But let's say that you have uh, a particular red that you're struggling to, um, to reproduce. You can use the optimization routine of the x right I1 profiler to say, let's do more samples around this red to increase our accuracy just because we don't have enough samples in there. So you can either tell it by specific colors or you could tell it to come up with uh, another set of patches that are based upon the first measurements. But in terms of OVA, um, I don't believe that happens during the optimization. I believe that only happens during the first profiling uh, step because um, it's not really anything's changing in the optimization that uh, you would need to do a further OVA correction. What could cause gaps in the color gamut on a created profile? Um, say the question one more time. Can you yes. repeat the what question? What could cause the gaps on a color gamut? Yes? Do you hear the me? The gaps on a color gamut. Um, that could be mismeasurements. Created in a profile. Yeah. yeah, so you open up your profile and it looks like someone scooped out some color or they sucker punched it in an area, or it just looks like it's a divot in there. That could be a, a, a bad measurement. Um, it could also be poor calibration. So this is why you want to check your calibrations before you make profiles, because obviously making profiles requires a lot of measurements, and you don't want to get to the end and go, geez, that's not good, and realize it was just something wrong with your calibration. So being able to check your calibrations to, you know, feel confident that, yep, I got that licked, everything's perfect, and then go on to your um, profiling. Uh, if you don't, if you know that your calibration is as good as it can be, and you know that you don't have any mismeasurements, and you can check that just visually within the i1 profiler just by seeing, you know, they have uh, the patch is split in half. There's a line between, so it shows you what it expected versus what it measured. It needs to be within the family, meaning if it's got a purple color, you shouldn't see a, uh, a yellow there <laughs> or a green. It should be kind of blue, it should be purple, it should be kind of in the family. But if it's way off there, then that's when you know that you've got a problem. Um, and if all else fails, they do have what I call the fudge uh, factor in there, which is a smoothness, which basically allows you to kind of uh, basically do some data smoothing uh, to kind of get rid of uh, some bad measurements that are in there. Uh, again, that's only within the i1 profiler product, uh, excuse me, i1 published product. Um, that's not available in the basic, and that's probably not available in the profiling uh, um, portion of your RIP. What is your take on the Onyx ICC profile builder using my 
X-Ride I1 IO2. Would you recommend this? Yeah, I mean the the Onyx does a great job, but as we've been discussing, is that there's certain things that are in the X-Ride product that you just can't do with the Onyx, and that doesn't mean the Onyx is a bad product, but you may find that there are certain things that you just can't address within the Onyx uh, profiling uh, uh, software that you could address within the X-Rite. So that's why I keep on going back to make a decision if you just want the device, that's the i1 Basic Pro 2, or if you want, you can get the i1 uh, uh, Published Pro 2, which includes your profiling software. So that way you have an option to say, you know what, I've gone as far as I can with the Onyx, I've spoken to them, um, I'm doing everything I can, but I'm still not able to address um, this accuracy of the red issues just because there is no tool to improve the accuracy on reds in my profiling capabilities within the Onyx. Now I know why I need to have that software is because I need to improve the accuracy on mapping those reds and, and that's why you would consider um, the x right. How much should you typically cut back on light inks when making a media profile with a 6C or an 8C, so 8 color printers. Okay, so they're asking for specific settings on how to cut back if you're using a 6 color or 8 color uh, ink set. And so I'm assuming when they say 6 color, they don't mean 6 primary colors, which would be kind of like a hexachrome. They're talking about having lights in there. So it's really a 4 color process with 6 inks. Um, but it's really uh, 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 media dependent. You can't really throw out and say, oh, you need to cut it back uh, at this point or do this sort of stuff. You have to really base it upon uh, your media, white point, and, and the uh, resolution that you're printing at. Um, that's going to play a huge uh, factor in it. Um, how many, uh, if you're using on like an Epson, like a microwave, or if you're not, you're, how many passes that you're using on an HP. Uh, so all these things have a dramatic impact upon how you're doing the transition between a light cyan and a dark cyan. So again, these are things that are uh, better seen uh, just by evaluating within the product of, like, let's say, Chromix ColorThink. You can print out those 10% tints and start evaluating, oh, geez, you know, if I put down more than 60%, I'm not getting any more color, and it's shifting cues. So I definitely want to clip there. But the question becomes of where do I want to start rolling off that light cyan and bringing in the dark cyan? And, you know, as I said, it's resolution dependent, media dependent, obviously printing technology dependent too. So I can't give you a hard and fast uh, rules on that. Does device link apply to these devices? Uh, device link is a color management. Uh, uh, option and what this person is saying is basically you take two profiles and you smash them together to become one profile. And it's like a hard-coded transform. So it's not so much dealing with calibration here as to say hey we're not going to go from CMYK to lab to CMYK we're just going to go from CMYK in out comes CMYK. So it's a useful tool um, and you can get uh, improved color matches, uh, but it's um, something that is uh, not used as much in grand format printing just because it's uh, not really known, and nor does the, the popular RIP platforms like Onyx, Caldera, uh, or EFI really promote that. Uh, but it is possible in all those uh, products to load up device links uh, the question becomes is, uh, is all your files going to come in the same way because they, if they're not then a device link is not going to be as helpful for you. If you're able to harmonize all to the same um, uh, reference color space before it hits the rip then uh, you may find that device link will work well for you. Okay. Also um, just to let uh People know we had actually a couple of uh, weeks ago a webinar specifically on I1 and device link where we explained the challenges. Uh, it was not specific to the grant format printed, but uh, um, I will make sure that you get uh, the information. If you're interested, just let me know. 
um, you know, through the chat uh, or through the questions. So I'll make sure that you receive those uh, links also to review that webinar. Um, uh, let me see. The next question is about does the G7 limit your device's uh, paper ink CMYK color gamut? Nope. G7 does not do any compression of your color gamut. All it is is just uh, adjusting the, let's call them Photoshop curves, for just an easy way to visualize that. We're just adjusting those Photoshop curves so when we print out a patch, let's say, for your 50% uh, uh, gray, would be 50 uh, cyan, 40 magenta, 40 yellow, and 0 black. Does that have a color bias? Does your 25, 19, 19, 0 have a color bias? And so we're just refining those Photoshop curves, which are in the rip, to make sure that they have uh, uh, as minimal color bias as possible. But that goes through the whole tonal range, but it doesn't do anything about color gamut compression. So applying G7 does not uh, do any gamut compression. In some places, I've seen it actually make prints more vibrant. So uh, if try doing this on like a, a mesh material, uh, it's a pretty dramatic shift from when you just do nice linear curves on mesh, which we all know it can't take much ink and it looks pretty low contrast. If you apply G7 to that, the whole thing starts to pop. And all you've done is just adjust your, your Photoshop curves in the rip to make sure that you have good gray balance. And the second part of that, which we haven't really discussed, which will be discussed in the next webinar, is it, it maintains a mid-tone contrast relative to the substrate's white point. So that's how you have more of a consistency as you go between different printing technologies and different substrates is that it maintains the same visual contrast. I'm sure everyone on this call has seen, hey, the color looks good, but why does it look so flat on this material? Can I get that same color that I have on this other material but in the same contrast? You know, that's not possible with just your regular linearization calibration routines, but it is possible if you implement G7. Also, the device links, we will be touching upon that in the third uh, webinar on communicating color. Okay. Actually, Dan, uh, we've been an hour already in, in, the, in the webinar. I will wow. drop just the, that last, uh, <laughs> just the last question. And the rest, uh, we will um, answer them. I'll try to put completely a Q&A uh, so that everybody has these uh, questions and answers written. Um, but the last one is about uh, swap, actually. I can hit swap perfectly from my printer, but how do I get a printer uh, to print maximum gamut? Example, get closer to a Pantone or better utilize the extra inks, orange and green, on an Epson GS6000? So if I understand the question correctly, is that there are <clears throat> images and, uh, and um, CMYK elements are matching fine within swap, but when there is a spot color, um, right now, the RIP is interpreting it in, as um, uh, a swap, or excuse me, it's, it's taking the numbers based upon swap instead of being the full gamut. That's a, more of a RIP um, challenge. So uh, depending upon the RIP, if it's a color burst, which it probably is if it's a GS6000, um, they do have ways where you can take the, 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 the spot color if it's properly spec'd out in your file, to map it to the full gamut of the printer profile that you've created instead of it being mapped through swap. So this means that that color has to be an independent plate, so it can't be a four color build. It has to be a separate plate in order for the RIP to pick it up and say, ah, this is what the color is. Now I know what your profile, your output profile is, uh, and now I'm able to simulate that. But um, again, this is uh, specific to the RIP that you're using. It will be different depending if you have an EOFI or a Caldera or an Onyx uh, that's driving it. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much, Dan, for all of your time. Thank you very much for all of the participants for your questions. As I mentioned, this webinar has been recorded, and uh, we will make sure that to make it available. Uh, stay tuned for the next uh, uh, two webinars. And uh, in, thank you, Dan. Any thank final you. words from your side? Yeah, folks, uh, you know, we have uh, another one coming up next month, and I hope that you're able to attend because we're going to talk about this thorny issue of G7. Um, it's uh, been bounced around uh, in many groups of it being useful or not useful, and so we're going to deep dive into that and uh, discuss the merits uh, of that uh, print calibration process. So I hope you can attend. Have a great rest of the day to everybody. Goodbye. Bye now.